Sukupuoli- ja seksuaalivähemmistöihin kohdistuva kontrolli ja rajoitukset eivät kaikkialla maailmassa ole historiaa kuten Suomessa. Eikä Suomen kehityskulkua asiassa voi pitää universaalina. Suomea saatetaan usein pitää myös sateenkaari-ihmisten oikeuksien mallimaana, vaikka täällä ei usein tunnisteta muualta tulleiden sateenkaari-ihmisten tarpeita. Seuraavassa keskustelussa Suomeen muuttaneiden sateenkaari-ihmisten paneeli käsittelee paitsi ihmisoikeustilannetta muualla maailmassa, myös rakenteellisia ongelmia, joita erityisesti muualta tulleet sateenkaari-ihmiset Suomessa kohtaavat. Tervetuloa seuraamaan keskustelua sateenkaari-ihmisten muuttoliikkeestä. Tervetuloa uudestaan. Tämä keskustelu käydään englanniksi. Our next discussion is going to be in English. Uh, and our title here today is Queer Newcomers Perspective on Queer Migration. Uh, welcome everyone. Welcome Hassan Hanini. And welcome Thomas Morse. How you pronounce your last name, by the way? Moose. Moose. And then we have uh, Abdullah Qureshi from Toronto. Good morning. Uh, Good morning. <laughs> I'm here. <laughs> yes, we see you. Everyone, good morning and good afternoon. I will introduce you a bit and then you can continue and take from there. Uh, Hassan Hanini is an LGBTQ activist who's been working in several organizations in Tunisia and also here in Finland. And then we have a performer, model and scientific researcher, Thomas Moos. Welcome. And then we have Abdullah Qureshi with us, an educator, artist and a curator. Welcome, everyone. And from the start, probably just I will give the, the floor or the mic <laughs> to Thomas. Can you please tell us more about what you do and about yourself? Yeah, uh, my name is Thomas. My pronouns are they, them. And uh, I'm originally from Italy, but I haven't lived there in eight, ten years. And I've moved to Finland two years ago. And yeah, I'm, as you say, like I'm a performer, a model and scientific researcher. Uh, Yeah, I think like that's pretty much it uh, at the moment. Um, I'm a trans non-binary person and everything related to trans issues uh, I will basically deal with between Finland and Italy. So yeah, it's a bit complicated, but it'll work out somehow. <laughs> Hassan? Yes, so my name is Hassan, and like you say that I'm from Tunisia. I moved to Finland now nine years ago. Still, I consider myself a newcomer, so <laughs> it takes a long time to feel like homey home. But um, yeah, and I work now for uh, Loiso Settlementi for a project named Bahar Project. So uh, what I do, we are working and uh, supporting youth uh, who are having facing uh, honor-related violence inside their community or their uh, family, and they need to detach from their family and community. So our project is, is not uh, an LGBTIQ project, but we have, uh, for my last statistic that I did it a few weeks ago, almost one third of my client are people belong to sexual and gender minority from different communities and different background. So this is like my work and my, um, how I say, like the free time that I have after the work, I more doing um, activist work and supporting the community from different way and especially working with asylum seeker and people who arrived to Finland during like those few years. Yes, that's shortly. Abdullahi, the floor is yours. Thank you for having me. Um, definitely very sad um, uh, about not being in Helsinki in person. So as mentioned, I'm Abdullah. I'm an artist, curator, and educator. Um, I moved to Toronto last year in the midst of the pandemic. Prior to that, I was based in Helsinki for three years. Um, I'm a doctoral candidate at Aalto University. My research project, um, which is artistic in nature, looks at, well, it's entitled Mythological Migrations, Imagining Queer Muslim Utopias. As such, I look at the so-called European migrant crisis as the point of departure, where specifically I focus on LGBTIQ immigrants uh, who came in as refugees and asylum seekers. Um, I was 
specifically interested in uh, several of the challenges they faced in terms of exclusion and fetishization as a community in spaces such as the nightclub um, or cruising sites such as dark rooms and bathhouses. So my research project examines that uh, specifically. Um, and yes, I'm honored to be here amongst uh, all of you. Thank you, everyone. Uh, I would like to first from the beginning, just tackle the whole Finland discussion. Uh, uh, there is this Finland is the best place to be discussion. You know that one? Yeah. What do you think this? Okay, so, so first, As before queer, I start, yes. when we are talking about now the topic of today, like the celebrating of 50 years of mm -hmm. discriminalization of the homosexuality in Finland, we need to still remember that we have 72 country who people still facing some of them death penalty, some of them prison. So for me, like being placed like that, I was kind of, yeah, for another people look like nice, start to be a museum to, 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 to come and see, but for me it brings a lot of feeling when I know uh, people from my country and friend and camera, they're still in one room and yeah, whatever. But to be, to, like what to say here about uh, the best country, um, like, I don't know how you how you see it, a best country. It's depending. If you are comparing a person come from country that I say where is still crime and you'll be facing uh, prison, yes, here you are. No one will put you in prison. Okay, but if you talk about um, rights and equality and be uh, like be in same position like a fiend white, then we have a lot to think to tell about it. So it's depending how you see it. About safety, probably, yes. But other level on, on work, uh, working, studying, uh, living in the society, be accepted, be feeling home, then probably not the best. Yeah. Abdullahi Thomas, you want? Abdullah, do you want to go first? Uh, sure. Um, I, I mean, I think it's always um, a complicated situation and a simplistic discussion when we, of course, frame uh, Finland as the best country because best in terms of what, right? So nothing, in my opinion, is is absolute and echoing what Hassan really said already is that, you know, there are a lot of things that, of course, work very well in Finland um, and other things that don't. In particular, um, from, from the kind of work that I've done, I've seen so many issues um, that are rooted in a long history of um, quote unquote invisible whiteness as it's been articulated, uh, where because there is a perceived notion of the country being the best, uh, it is also assumed that it cannot be racist and have uh, such problems uh, when really uh, like a lot of other contexts, there is still a long way to go um, in Finland as well. Uh, I think like, uh what I want to highlight or want to like ask ask probably is this homo nationalism discussion. Mm -hmm. uh, Abdullahi, you said that you've been working on spaces with art. Do you, how what do you think about the whole topic and how you how you've been trying to tackle that with your art? Um, I think in in my context, um, what I particularly do is look at um, a community that faces double exclusion, right? Um, I'm originally from Pakistan and um, and, uh, and and I think that, you know, there are a lot of kind of issues that qu the queer community, LGBT community face in Pakistan. And at the same time, we see um, very interesting um, and radical ways the community creates spaces for themselves there and exists over there, right? Um, and at the same time, I think that, you know, when when we were looking at uh, a lot of the migratory pathways that LGBTIQ plus refugees and asylum seekers took, many were escaping um, um, incredibly violent contexts um, and gender and sexual persecution. And so when they came to Europe and also to Finland, they, of course, came in search of quote unquote freedom. 
And so, uh, you know, from the border, from the onset, we see uh, questions that kind of interrogate their sexuality and gender identities from a very Western lens. Um, so if we think about uh, someone who's gone being discreet all their lives because otherwise they would be killed, suddenly they have to bear all that they did um, in bed to this officer that they're not familiar with, but if they're unable to do that quote unquote correctly, they're not, uh, they won't actually be allowed in from, from the very border, right? Um, but I think for me, what was most interesting was that when, when people are even accepted, uh, the kind of challenges that they face um, on ground in the city. So in Helsinki's case, and Hassan may also be able to speak about this, um, uh, a few years ago, we saw a pattern of rejections at the nightclubs, uh, which later on was protested and I believe has been uh, rectified to a great extent now due to the work that activists like Helsinki and communities have done on ground. But at the same time, that issue fascinated me where the queer Muslim body, um, you know, kind of became um, a, a site to target uh, because queerness, as we understand it in the Western sense, seems to emerge from a very secular way of thinking and from these colonial and orientalist histories muslim is seen as a culture as an identity that is yet to arrive at modernity quote unquote um and so the two kind of seem like in contradiction with each other mm -hmm. and so that is what i really interrogate as in my own work but also in mm -hmm. terms of um also in terms of the larger community i think to continue from what abdullah now is saying because I will answer this question from the point of view of the client that I was working with and what kind of experience they be facing when they are arriving here and living here in Helsinki and other city. So first, what I want to mention, the example that uh, Abdullah already told about, what name it, gay places. So a lot of my clients, they be reporting, they feel that they be uh, discriminate or they be target of um, uh, ethnic profiling in some doors and some place. So we know all here that we have some law that you cannot access to place for sell alcohol if you are under a certain age. But this is doesn't like doesn't go same way if you are white thin, no one will ask about your age. Usually if you are look like you are adult, they access. But now with people of color, usually if even you look 30, 40, they still stop you to access. They use this law, we know it, because they know very well asylum seekers, they don't have ID card. Since you arrive to this country, even you get a pass you have a passport from your country, you give it to the police, police usually they don't give nothing back. And when you start living in a reception center, they give you a card to show where you live, your name, and birthday. This card can stay with you probably three years. Some people with this card since 2015, and they cannot do anything with this. So this is one example, for example, about this homonationalism, what we have it. I feel it's very strong. And when we talk about it inside the community, and I mean, the LGBT community, and people, they react differently, but more like, you know, this is the law in the country. You know, this is how it's work. It's like they try to explain something that we can make it different. You know, we can make a pressure on certain places that don't do that to someone who look already clear the age. If you want to understand Identify the age. You found the age. You can find it in different way. Not like just to to use it like excuse to kick people out from certain places. Um, other example also that I have that my client was talking about it. Those um, uh, what's called gay again gay application like those uh, uh, application dating application, Grinder, Hornet, whatever. And then you can see the real, like, <laughs> many things when people I say they have those profiles, I say like, no Asiatic, no African, no black, go home, all those kind of things. That is really, leave it. But also you have other type when, of people who are more kind of, um, I'm sorry if I use this term, like using, they, they know that the asylum seekers are in vulnerable position and they use their power. They don't really recognize the power they have it when they ask someone like to come to their place and then introduce some sexual thing. And the person usually say like, okay, you can say no, but they are not in position to say no. And they need for some time place to sleep. We have many, we have some number of undocumented people and those undocumented people, they need place to sleep, warm, food and things like that. So this kind of power relation, it's, it's, it's not very wrong with, yeah. 
Yeah. And I think it also includes include this kind of a fetishizing. Fetishizing, exactly. Yes. What Abdullah said about it, yes. like the body of the immigrant, this a Muslim, whatever. It starts to be like a, a yes. kind of fetish for some people, and yeah. But there is always this kind of a white saviorism in also the queer, like white queer community here in Finland. People, like the first assumption is, as you are, for example, in my case, from a Muslim background, and you are black, you are already in a position that you need saving. Mm. Yeah, and the assumption yeah. comes from there. Like, yeah, I can take you here and do that, and da 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 da. And mm. Exactly. Yeah. If I continue a little bit with some personal experience that I, I experienced this on 2018 when I was um, in the head of uh, the Helsinki Pride community, and uh, we are in the, Helsin uh, in the Pride March, And I remember it was the first time that I used the, um, or I think many people start to use it in the same year, but I used the inclusive rainbow flag. So it was the flag with only the two black and brown uh, part. And the amount of the criticize that I get it from Finn, white, it was quite like su surprising for me because many people, they attack me in the way that you are not respecting the history of the flag, you are kind of unrespect the work that people be doing to get there, you just now adding whatever color you want. So they, they really like the communication went this way. But I was so happy and proud that few years now, even the Helsinki city used the inclusive. So at least it's, at least it's we are a little bit going there. Yeah, and also like the fact, like as you mentioned, like the, the new flag, includes like the black and brown um, lines, uh, strips. Mm -hmm. And uh, the thing is like, we need to remember that the gay rights movement started from black trans women. And the thing is like the majority of people, especially the majority of gay, of white LGBT community, don't really like understand and don't, they don't really know the real history mm -hmm of LGBT rights because it all started from like black trans women in US and then from there it moved forward. And it's always been like black trans women at the forefront mm -hmm. of the community and the forefront of like, uh, like if we have some rights now, it's thanks to like black trans women. So the thing is like the fact that like even like white people within the LGBT community still act the way that they act is like, It makes no sense because, like, like we arrived here thanks to like BIPOC people, especially. What? Do, why do you think it took so long to realize? It also, Abdullahi, I, we are having a discussion, so this is not a interview. Just come and jump. Yeah. What do you I think? Mean, why it took so long? Why do you think it took so long for them? Uh, I, I'm not sure. Like, I feel like. Because as I was studying the history of, of LGBT rights, like the thing is like at the beginning there was like especially cis white gay people um, that were like they were like oh we will find we will like get rights for us and then we'll deal with your rights, especially with trans people uh, and especially with BIPOC trans people. There, it was like yeah let's get our rights first because like let's work on this one and then work on the other one later. But then the later never came. And like there's been like the history of like Sylvia Rivera and Marsha P. Johnson, people that like started the movement and like they became uh, homeless because like no one from the community was taking care of them. And this is the case not only like in the 60s, but also like right now. So like I personally have no idea what happened in between, but the, the, probably like... That's how we started. I mean, the way I uh, to kind of also pick up a bit on that, I think um, for me, um, and I guess this will also touch a bit upon um, issues of fetishization. Um, in many ways, I look at um, a range of sources in visual culture, and incidentally, Tom of Finland does make a very interesting example here. One in terms of how. Uh, race is depicted in 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 his work, um, in particular the black body, but to address more specifically this question of what happened in between when we we do know for a fact that black uh, trans women led the way for uh, the way we have our rights today 
And I, I mean, incidentally, also in Pakistan, we know that uh, at present, the movement is led by um, trans women there as well. So there seems to be kind of like a consistent pattern. Um, but I think what happened in between uh, is, is well illustrated in Tom of Finland's work in terms of how uh, the gay identity was constructed um, in terms of masculinity, in terms uh, and how it was exaggerated um, in so many ways. Where um, you know, to be femme, to be quote unquote a fairy, was seen as derogatory. Like I am gay, uh, but I don't have to be feminine. And somehow, being feminine became something bad in in certain kind of um, from a certain kind of perspective. And so, I think that you know, there is um, you. Know, know what what we're seeing now the shift that we're seeing now is probably a deconstruction of masculinity and uh, patriarchy that's also taking place alongside a racial discussion so in that sense i do think that the trans body of course and the non-binary body is a radical body it's an incredibly radical body because it it forces us to confront um, and grapple with the kind of violence of the gender binary right uh, that we exist as male or female only um it, it kind of starts or it kind of paves the the way to deconstruct um, the, the very fabric of our societies, the way we exist today in this control setting, but also alter our language, you know? And I think that's where the fear is, and that's why it is probably suppressed um, so much until now. I was thinking, like, thank you, Abdullahi, for the comment. I was. Uh, it came to my mind that uh, it's also interesting how from the previous discussions here, but like in general, I think that uh, in Finland, the queer scene just realized their privileges after the BOC or BIPOC bodies came to the country, queer bodies. And then they had to somehow deal with their whiteness, not only because how I know, and my, my own research is not the, the best, but like how I know a person fr always, put on a marginalized, and then you realize that you actually have power. And I don't know what happens, but also um, people don't know how to deal with that. And then there is a person who is marginalized in so many ways. Uh, and I don't think that the system realize those struggles or these kind of uh, obstacles. Uh, and I wanted to ask you, um, what do you think, what kind of a structural barriers or obstacles or um, there in Finland that only, not only, but like you as a like migrant queer realize what probably nobody else might notice? Okay, so let's start with that for me, probably yes, the sir. easiest way. I think from, again, like the client that I work with and um, are most of them uh, have an asylum seeker background, so they come here like asking the asyl or the protection and then start the first struggle. So how to uh, make the authority believe your sexuality. So imagine, I don't know how many uh, person here from Finland born and identify themselves like LGBTIQ, or you need to prove it to someone. Yes, for us people of color, when we arrive here and we ask the protection, we need to prove it. We need to show it and make the person who's front of us, random, we don't know it, believe that we are. So mostly of the cases of the people, they get negative decision because they don't believe that they are belong to LGBTIQ. Or they don't know how to speak about that. Uh, or the way how they like explain themselves, the vocabulary is used, it's very far from the Western vocabulary. So in the system, this doesn't go with the narrative of a rainbow person in Western countries. So then we don't believe you. This is how it's happened. So this is the first, I think, struggle. But then it's go more and more to many other level. For me, I want to just give the example of a trans uh, asylum seeker. The trans asylum seeker here, even if they start the process of the transition and starting taking the hormone treatment in Turkey, for example, I have many clients who came for, through Turkey and be living there for three, four years, so they start to think there. When they arrive, you cannot start nothing here. You cannot start the process, you cannot go 
do anything till you get your first residence permit. So imagine if you already start the plastic surgery, starting already taking hormone treatment, and you arrive and you go to live inside reception center, and you stop everything. So what kind of struggle, what kind of like situation you will face? Uh, I think what I want also to say, like the safe space in general, and here safe space from like I say, uh, reception center when people, they leave. We don't have any like rainbow reception center here in Finland. And it's not something that it's not possible. You have other countries who make rainbow asylum seeker places where people can be faced so they don't need to feel like leave all this bullying and uh, rape and sexual harassment and be outing to their family. Not everyone who arrive here, their family know about. And some people, they need to stay in the closet or be forced to be out. So no one make this decision if you are living in reception center like that. Uh, also, when something happen out from your community, the safe space, uh, safe uh, houses doesn't exist for the rainbow. And just I'm coming from a conference last week and I found out that Denmark already opened the first uh, rainbow safe house in Denmark. And this is something really, really nice to hear and good for them. Um, many other things. Like racism inside, like workplace, so schools, uh, I don't know, a lot. The list is very long. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, definitely. Um, from my perspective, like, I'm very privileged in my position because I, I come from, like, a European country. And, like, if you live uh, from in the European Union, it's very easy to, like, for example, get, like, a resident permit. Uh, and also, like, for me, like, I was working at the time that I was asking the resident permit, so, like, I, I got it quite easily. Uh, the problem that I face, mainly, like, as a trans person is, like, well, how would the, how to, like, like, the transition, generally speaking, how it works, so you basically go to the general doctor, you need to tell the doctor, like, hey, I'm a trans person, they need to believe you as well. Mm -hmm. And then they gave you a referral to the gender clinic. And there is two gender clinics in the whole of Finland. One is in Helsinki, one is in Tampere. So also the problem is also like if you live in the north of Finland, that's like how do you get to Tampere or to Helsinki? And also like the general um, doctors in the north also have struggled a lot like to give referral to people. Um, but for me personally, like... For example, I've identified, like, I changed my name uh, as, as Thomas, like, about a year ago, and I still haven't accessed the, the gender clinic because I have a mental health issue, and now the gender clinic works. It's like you need to deal with your mental health issue before you access the, the gender clinic. Mm -hmm. The problem is my mental issue, my mental health issue is, is worse than by my gender dysphoria. So if I don't treat gender dysphoria, I keep having mental issue. And like, it's, it's, it's a weird cycle that, um, yeah, like it keeps going on because I still haven't get access to the gender clinic. It might take a couple of months. And then there's also the problem that like, I'm lucky that I live in Italy, it's three hours flight. I live in Milan. Uh, I mean, my original city mm -hmm. is Milan. So like, it's three hours flight, and so like if I need, but the thing is like if I need to change my documents or my gender or my, um, sorry, my name or my gender in the documents, then I need to fly back or I need to go through the embassy, but like it, Italian bureaucracy is like the worst thing ever, so like it's easier just to fly back. And also like, I don't know where can I get like, because like you need to get a diagnosis of being trans or non-binary, like in Finland there's like two diagnoses, one is like you are either trans or you are non-binary, once you get the diagnose, then you can start like hormonal treatment or like surgery or whatever you feel like doing it. Um, but at the same time, like all these things takes a lot of time. And like for me, like yeah, it's a struggle, it's very just like not comfortable and like every, I still have documents that don't state my, my name, like, I don't have Thomas on my documents. And like, yeah, for me, it's like discomfort and not too much of a problem, but for other people, like, it is like a risk of violence. Thank you for sharing. So, um, how about you, Abdullahi? Do you think, do you want to share something? 
Or do you want me to repeat the question? Um, if you could repeat the question, please, so that I can kind yeah. of circle. I ask, like, what structural barriers or, like, institutional obstacles uh, on bureaucracy you've noticed here uh, in Finland what only uh, a person from non-white queer person might notice? I think um, I can speak, I mean, and certainly, like, I also... Um, Uh, came to Finland in in a fairly privileged context in the sense that I arrived as a doctoral candidate. So it's a very different process um, to come in. There is, of course, as a Pakistani passport holder, there is a process of applying for visa, uh, proving that you have enough funds, et cetera, et cetera. There, but it's certainly not uh, the same as um as it is for a refugee or asylum seeker so there's no comparison there but what i can talk about the s systemic uh obstacles and and challenges um is what i've certainly noticed in academia as well for people of color for bipoc folks um i think i think the the lack of uh Uh, conversation on on indigenous communities in I mean there's very limited conversation on indigenous communities in Finland anyway in academia but also I think the challenges that the rest of the black and people of color face are immense um, and this can happen in terms of questioning the legitimacy of your research it can be in terms of questioning um, the quality of your research um, and you know it, And, and, you know, it's not always, uh, you know, and not everyone is necessarily as well versed or articulate in, for instance, um, a language that is not their, their um, native one, but at the same time, what they say and what they kind of um, discuss can still be very worthy um, just because we are not kind of, just because they are not necessarily positioning um, their way of thinking in a very Western centric way. Uh, manner doesn't automatically mean that their research is bad or what they say is not valid as as uh, knowledge right so I think those are the kind of obstacles that I've seen um, and then of course I mean I haven't looked at statistics recently uh, but the the kind of diversity in in faculty and those who teach courses can also be very telling in this very way I want to add just one point here about the immigration and the number of the asylum seeker. Um, usually every th all the information here in Finland is very transparent. You can find any number you want. You want to know something. But we don't have any number about how many asylum seekers apply uh, the protection here in Finland based on their sexual ident identity and gender. So we don't know are they are 1,000 every year or 10 or 2,000 immigration service, they don't put this and we cannot found it. And then we don't also found how many they get the residence permit based on their sexuality for the protection. So this for me is very important uh, kind of information that we needed, some kind of data to see how many probably person be kicked out also. You know, because because at least with the people I, I work with, I feel like, oh my God, it's sometimes like when one probably from the 10 or two from 10 I work with, they get the residence and still the other stay f continuing and fighting. And I don't know really in statistic how much, and it's important to see, yeah. That's a very good point. And I think on that, like there are so many... Well, we spoke previously outside, but also here in the discussion, you mentioned so many times the language. Um, I, I would say, not to give you a straight answer, but like I would say it's also a taboo, even though you know the reason why you want to get out from the, your country of birth. You, if you don't feel safe here, how you would be even willing to admit that to yourself? that actually the, what, the reason why, the actual reason why you apply for the, the asylum, for the safety, is that? 
from my experience, I see the clients say the first thing is trust. People yes. come from country where they are traumatized by authority, yes. traumatized by police, by everyone who have a power. So yes. you cannot expect from them from day one or year exactly. one that will be front of uh, the immigration officer or police to say like, yeah, by the way, I'm this and this. They feel the shame. They have people carrying the shame, the guilty. All those kind of feeling will not get away in one day. I'm like, yeah, you arrive to Finland, you arrive to the paradise. It doesn't work like that. People, they need the time to process. They need to hide a little bit. And then they found the power to come out because it is coming out. It's like forcing people to come out, you know? So, so it, 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 it's a time, it's a process. And also to find yourself in front of a translator, person who will interpret everything you say from the same community. And when you come from a collective society, you know very well that people are connecting with the name of the family. Just, I am from a Tunisia. Give me a Tunisian family name. I can tell 80% from the person which area I come. So people will know each other. They're very connected because the family mean a lot for them. So when you have a person know the family name, it can know what's your area, who's your relative. They will find connection. So this is make more pressure on them to come out because they don't, many clients uh, told me, I don't know what's tomorrow. I was keeping this secret to me yeah. because I feel like if I will be rejected and get it out, at least this secret stay with me. No one will find out. And they have right. They have right, I think. Yes. And it's actually very in, uh, realized like this is also another topic, mm. another discussion yeah. about yeah. like uh, coming to Europe and hear this whole pride discussion as a minority or as a margin here people like it's not a safe place for some people to go on pride or to have this kind of rainbow uh, events clubs months it's dangerous for some of us this is so, true, I should um, comment about yes. the Together work that Helsinki Pride community started since 2015. They're doing amazing. And since then, we have every year block for the people who are um, immigrant asylum seekers arrive. And may we prepare people that you don't need to participate this way. The participation of Pride can be a different way. You can just stay and watch the whole parade march or people prepare their own art thing to, to hide their face. So it's true we have a people here for more than six years and they participate in the pride and every year with cover face because still they feel unsafe. The safety is a big question mark. Uh, about the safety, I want to uh, also, because it's super heavy discussion. In a way, it's emotional and it's personal and I really don't like it and it's so uncomfortable. Uh, I want to take this for a better place uh, and also talking about safe spaces uh, and also take this discussion on healing and uh, empowerment. Um, Thomas, I wanna, do you want to tell us about your art and about your, what you do and how you deal with this kind of a healing, dis healing in general, please? Yeah, definitely. Like uh, when you were talking about the safe uh, spaces earlier, like like the first thing that came to my mind is like I came to Finland and I didn't have a community because it takes a while to get to know people. And also like I came here and after six months it was lockdown. So like have fun making friends during lockdown. Um, but once like the restriction got uh, easier, like I got to know the ballroom, uh, the Finnish ballroom scene in Helsinki. And like it was through them and through like the acceptance and, and the safety that I receive in that community that I was able, I, I allowed myself to discover about my own gender. And then from there I found out like, well, I'm actually non-binary, I'm actually trans and like they helped me a lot uh, to accept myself and to be myself. But there's still like a lot of places that I just pretend I'm a cis white guy but which I'm not, but like I'm not a cis guy, but uh, there is st still some places that I don't want to out myself, but at the same time, like safe uh, community and safe spaces are really important for people because like you're allowed to be yourself in that place. And it takes a while to, once you feel safe, it takes a while to actually like allow yourself to go through those questions and find out who you are and like allowing yourself to explain to other people who you are. So like for me like healing is it goes through heart it goes through art but also like it goes through like community. 
um, especially for me, like especially like with ballroom and like other people related to the ballroom community. And it's yeah, like the kind of art that I do is like I perform and I do something similar to burlesque. So like I usually get naked on a stage and. Uh, yeah, <laughs> this is the first time, so I'm still wearing clothes. <laughs> this is the first time. Um, but yeah, like for example, like I'm a trans masculine person, like I've never seen photos or videos of uh, people wearing a binder and being hot and sexy. So that's something that I want to like also show to, to people uh, in the audience and show to people like through Instagram or having discussion within the community. So like there is different, like everyone has their own way of dealing with healing, but I feel like every each and one of us in the community heals in, in a way that we help each other and we are healing as a community. That's so beautifully said. How about you, Abdullah? How do you how you deal with healing and how you heal yourself? Yeah, so collective he I mean I believe in collective healing and radical joy. That is certainly integral to um, how I try to live my life, but also in terms of how I uh, make my work. Um, and I believe community is integral to that. I think that in, in Helsinki, for instance, um, an initiative that Hassan has been a founder of, an organizer of the LGBT cafe, um, provided that space for me to be amongst um, people of color, people who were from similar contexts to create um, that safe space where otherwise it wasn't possible. I think what I've seen in, in these gatherings, in these assemblies um, and why they're radical is because they create the opportunity for us to be in conversation with each other. So for instance, a, a queer Muslim is not a singular category. Uh, Muslim is not singular and queerness is not singular. And similarly, you know, anyone who's a person of color will know this, uh, but it is not like it's it's not like a singular category. It's 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 a very complex and diverse category, right? We can be queer and Muslim, for instance, and not always see eye to eye. You know, our understanding of faith can be very different from each other. But but if we are constantly in conversation with quote unquote the other, or or we are othered, we are forced to adopt these kind of reductive narratives about ourselves. So when we are actually in community with those who share some histories, some background, it creates the potential for healing because we are then in conversation with each other about, um, about our own complexities and diversities where you know we 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 can expand our own understanding of our identities the way we adopt them. So yeah, so I think for me, that organization and need for creating gatherings um, is, is, is essential in the work that I do because I, I see that as the pathway for collective healing. Thank you. Hassan, how about you? For our work, I think the way how we do it, it's more what we create, same what we think, like the community work. The community work is creating the safe space, safe space for people to be themselves. We come there, the clients come there. Usually we organize, not usually, all our activity are kind of these closed groups, not open event. And uh, we really few open events we do it, but mostly they are kind of close group. People uh, have like this peer support group, sharing experience and uh, knowledge also, because feel some people they need the knowledge, they need power, they need tools to start make their own boundaries and limit and know how to live in this new society probably for them. And um, yeah, so mostly like this kind of. Uh, Community work. But do how about you personally? How you heal? Me? Yeah, you are yourself <laughs> beside. I can think power from all of you, so I'm fine. With okay. <laughs> okay. This yeah. is my way. I absorb power from. Yes. <laughs> power vampire. Exactly. Power vampire. <laughs> Thank you very much for the discussion. I would Thanks. like to open the discussion also from with the audience, uh, if we have somebody. Who wants to ask? Kaura? Yes, there is a comment in the chat. Uh, 
from Valpuri that Thomas's story about the gender clinic sounds very familiar and uh, I think the Finnish trans process in the in whole is flawed and complicated so it very much resonates about the uh, about the uh, trans uh, or the situation of trans rights in Finland which is definitely not the best best place of the world to be in <laughs> Yeah, definitely. Also, like uh, going back to the first thing that we were saying, like the Finni Finland is is from outside is considered like the best country, and the thing is like it's one of the only country that still requires trans people to be sterile mm. to actually change their gender on the documents. So, in terms of trans right, there is still a lot of work to do, yeah. and the process is like super slow. Mm. Is there? Other question online? I would like to ask you, for, because we have a couple of time, and we are the last. Are we the last here? Yes, and you don't have life. We can, you can talk. You, <laughs> yes, you we have to. Go home, stay here, <laughs> yes, to us. we are in prison. So, <laughs> yes. Um, I would like to ask you about, like, do you follow the news on, on your own country? Like, how is it there? Yeah. And are you ac active in that field? Yep, for me, yes, I'm still following the news very closely and very active and supporting my community there also. So I know very well what's going on and still... Uh, I have an organization that I already started before I moved here and was in the board and the chair I was of the organization. And uh, now, uh, yeah, the situation is not that well. It's really... <laughs> my next question is like, is there something we can learn? Learning? Yeah. Ah, about learning, I think... Because for me, what I found in Tunisia, we have this uh, code penal uh, or criminal uh, code 230 that criminalized homosexuality and the homosexual person can be in prison between six months to three years, depending on the judge, how much want to give. Some people six months and some people can up to three years. And uh, this law, it doesn't exist before Tunisia have the first constitution or one of the first countries have constitution since the... 80s, something like that, or like 70s actually, and and then uh, this law come from the French colonization. So when the French come and colonize the country, they found like, oh, those people look so liberal. And it, honestly, like you are telling, like Hassan, not telling any story. Like no, people there in Tunisia, <laughs> we have kind of liberal life, and they do think in their own way. Probably that's not same like here now. Name it like, but not very strict. Like it, that exists the queerness and the homosexuality in the society and was accepted in certain family. But then when the French colonization came, found the society that is okay, doesn't go with the Christian probably belief on the time and they make those kind of law. So the day when they left, it stayed and it was translated. People here will ask like why people, they didn't return to the previous life. Of course they didn't return because they felt that on the time I have some friend who's a sociologue, he make kind of small research about this kind of phenomenon. They was traumatized. Some hetero cis men, they feel their masculinity was in threat by the Western, by the French men. They be a lot of women who was be raped and they feel they cannot protect their family and the women. And they, th they think still, if they will give up on this law and give up on it, we will be look like the Western family and the Western society that it's not anymore attached, you know, and like the, the picture of the man and the woman is not same like the way how they want to conserve. So for us, it's really a big fight there. You have a lot of people now talking about the disc discrimination of the homosexuality in Tunisia, but still I feel it will not solve the problem because the society is not ready. So even if the law will go away, I feel the society is not ready to accept it. So it's quite long, I think. So I hope we learn here that I think, for me, that, that what we have today is not guarantee will stay. <laughs> I think can change in different ways. So we need always to be alert and defending our rights, because otherwise it will collapse. How about you, Thomas? Yeah, um, like, I was like... <laughs> I feel conflated, ab conflicted about reading the news, especially from Italy, um, because every time I, I read the news from Italy, there's something negative going on. Um, and it reminds me why I left and why I don't want to go back. Uh, for example, last week, 
there, there's been like a long process that is, I honestly have no idea how long it was, but it was a very long process. And there was a parliament that tried to uh, pass a law uh, uh, that protects uh, LGBT community and disabled people. And um, it will make, for example, it will make homophobia a hate crime. Uh, the law uh, last week didn't pass the Senate, and like there were, there, it was like super like horrifying moment when there was like the majority of the right and far right parliaments in parliament that when the law didn't pass, they start cheering. There was like it looks like they they won the game at the football match or something like that, and like it was horrifying because like. The problem with that law is not only like we still don't have rights that protect us. The thing is like this creates hate, like, this creates, like this like send a message to people in the streets that homophobia, transphobia is, is, is okay. Politician like can cheer about it. So like this has created like a sequence of like violence towards like uh, LGBT people in Italy that like every time I open Instagram and read some news, there is someone that has been attacked. And there is someone that has been attacked because of sexuality or because of their gender identity. And they, don't, they are not protected by law. So like it's, it's very hard to read those news. And at the same time, I don't have an Italian community here in Helsinki. I don't have that much connection with Italian people back home. So like it's, it, this, it's this, we are feeling of being like weirdly close, but at the same time very distant from the situation. But at the same time, for example, like uh, Luca was showing the map of Europe and LGBT rights, and like I didn't even realize, but Italy has, uh, is worse than Hungary. And like we, like I was part of the uh, organizing the protest when the, the Hungarian laws uh, passed, like in June, yeah, it was June. And like, I didn't even realize that my own country is doing worse than, than Hungary. And like, we, I don't think there's been any protest about Italian laws here. I know there's been some in Italy and in London, but not here. And this is also uh, what terrifies, uh, it's so close. As, and I, now, when you to, now when you explain this, it's like, yeah, as Hassan said, if we don't fight it, it might happen and change. Uh, and I already did a mistake that I took it to the wrong side. I said I was speaking about healing, and now I drag <laughs> into this again. But like me, Ab Ab me and Abdullah, we are out of the map that they talk about. <laughs> <laughs> we are out of it. <laughs> but I want to uh, hear you, Abdullah. Your how how is how is in how are you, and how is in your relationship with Pakistani activism and queer scene? So I'll quickly um, address this as well. I think for me, um, I, I am certainly in the fortunate position where I get to go back a lot. Um, I maintain an active uh, connection with quote unquote home uh, and multiple homes. Um, and so in that sense, I think that um, I feel that in many ways I arrived at my queerness in Pakistan in the sense that um, despite having lived a lot of my adult life outside Pakistan, I had a sense of being out of place. Um, and so it was amongst other queer people in Pakistan that I really started to identify and make sense of who I was. Um, I'm not going to go into the legal uh, discussion because that's a long discussion. Um, uh, but but at the same time, I think that, you know, as I was saying earlier, that there are uh, things that we have to uh, fight for a long way to go. And then there are other radical things that I feel work in, in, in uh, better than they do in the West at times. Uh, for instance, we don't have a pride, but there's also not need, uh, the community echoes that there isn't a need for the pride uh, the same way, right? There are other ways of expressing pride. And so when I go back, I work with community in artistic ways. I make films together. I collaborate with other queer folks uh, who, uh, and work across generations of queer folks in Pakistan. And in that sense, I think that even though there isn't um, a public uh, or, or a mainstream discussion yet, at least at, at the kind of, um, at, 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 in the kind of underground tunnels of society, there, there is the kind of, um, 
the material, the conversations, the kind of histories that are being created that will once uh, at one point or eventually be accessed. So at least the building block for that is being laid out where we're collectively finding uh, and discovering who we are. Thank you. I really like the, uh, the saying like under, underground railroad uh, kind of work, which is, it resonates. I want to thank you all. It was a pleasant, super informative. I learned. Um, I wasn't that nervous. Mm, thank you for, for the audience. Thank you for the day. Uh, Thomas, Hassan, Abdullahi, uh, stay safe. And thank you for my behalf. <laughs>